Welcome to the webinar. My name is uh, Brooke Edmonds and I'm with OSU Extension and I'm in Linden Benton County and in, in the horticulture department as well. And we are trying something new because um, we're really, uh, we're all stuck at home, but we're also looking at our fruit trees and we're seeing our mason bees and we have lots of questions about them. So I am joined today by two of my uh, master gardener friends who are also experts in mason bees. And um, so we have Rich Little on the line here. And then we also have Renee Webb, who uh, is also a master gardener, who many of you may have known if you've taken any of our master gardener classes. I am gonna pass it over and let Rich uh, first, and then maybe Renee, just introduce yourselves um, and you know, tell us a little bit about your experience with mason bees, and then we'll get dive right into the Q&A. Thank you, appreciate it very much, Brooks. Um, I'm Richard Little, I'm retired, have been retired, which just simply means I'm not being paid anymore for about 10 years. Now I have the opportunity to do what I really enjoy, and that is bees. So ever since I've been up here in Oregon, I've been quite involved with the uh, mason bees and slowly over the time become much more involved with the mason bees through the Master Gardener program and with other related programs as well. So I am very passionate about these bees and I'm looking forward to any opportunity I can to help you become a better bee person such as myself. Thank you. And I'm Renee Webb. And I became a Master Gardener in 2013. And thanks to Rich, I learned a lot about mason bees and I have been, become very passionate about them as well. I, I teach a lot of classes now to community groups and also uh, have been working a lot with the um, cocoon harvesting classes in the fall and then even teaching at uh, the Bee Event Pollinator Conference. So. Um, if I don't know an answer, I go to Rich <laughs> and he can usually answer me or he'll find out and get back to me. So, uh, but I have learned a tremendous amount over the last five, six years from Rich and have also been involved in Bee Notes, which we'll talk about more later. Awesome, all right, guys. One other thing I'd like to add, if okay. I may. Um, one thing <clears throat> I want you to keep in mind for all the information that we're gonna be sharing with you is there's many ways to rear mason bees. There's not only one way. We do want you to realize that the ways that we are recommending are what we call the best management practices. We feel to optimize the health and the number of healthy bees produced, this is what we've learned over the many years when I say we, I'm talking about all the bee people throughout the United States because I attend numerous conferences where we share this information. So do keep that in mind. You may be doing mason bees and you may be saying, but I'm mirroring them. They're doing okay. That's great. We just want you to be aware that there are many other little ways that maybe you can fine tune your process to make the healthy bees even healthier and to produce more of them. Go ahead. Even we have changed some of the recommendations over time. So, uh, because yes. we're learning new things each time too. Yes. All right, you ready for any questions? <laughs> um, so, Diana has a question. She says, I have many cocoons hatching, but no evidence of mating or filling tubes yet. Any thoughts, any concerns? Okay, this is a very common one. To try to give a perspective of what's happening here is in the little emergence room, which many of you are using, some of them look like this, but whatever you're putting the cocoons in, once you put those cocoons out, it may be several days before the bees will even come out of that emergence too. If it's the male, they're gonna hang around and wait for the females to come out. Usually they all emerge first. And then the female will follow several days later. Once the female comes out and mates, she then orients her herself through orientation flights in front of the block and the emergence tube, where she does this kind of figure eight, creating a mental map of the landscape. Then she disappears and she disappears 
could be two, three, four, five days. What she's doing is she's out there looking for food, eating the food, which is usually pollen. That's where she gets the protein she needs to finish the development of the reproductive system and to start the development of the eggs within her reproductive system. So after a period of two to five days, she will then come back to the block and orient herself, okay, this is where I'm gonna rear my kids. She starts one hole, puts the mud wall in the back, goes out and collects pollen and nectar, puts the cell, puts an egg on it, seals it, starts the next cell. It may be a week or two before she fills that cell up and you see a mud plug. That mud plug may not appear to three or four weeks after she came out of the emergence tube. So that's why in the beginning, many people think, oh my God, the bees have died. I don't see anything, nothing's happening. If you wait a month, it will look like Grand Central Station. But prior to that time, you're not gonna see much activity at all. One good way that you know is on your emergence tube or your box, is you may see little light brown tan stains. I have a copy of that, I'm gonna show it to you. Okay. Uh, or a, a, an example of that, um, if you can see it, you can see the brown stains. I, I like watching that because then I know that the bees have started to emerge. Go ahead, Rich, sorry. Okay, I hope probably that will answer your question. Great, thank you. Um, Sandy has a question. She, uh, they want to know, do I need to seed my tubes the first time? I mean the box most likely. If you put out a block like this right here and it's brand new, if you have never had mason bees before, it can be very, very challenging to get them for the first time. If you have cocoons in an emergence tube and you're putting them on the block, they will adopt the block. But if you have just a block and nothing else, it can be very challenging. You can speed this up if you are lucky enough to know someone who has mason bees. What you do is you get the empty cocoons that is after the bees have left. You take a bunch of those cocoons, maybe a dozen of them, and you pick a hole and you stuff them in there. Just jam them in. What happens is those cocoons have a variety of chemicals associated with them. And if a female mason bee comes around and smells some of the chemicals that are produced on that cocoon, a thought process seems to be, oh, this must be a successful site because I smell cocoons. And so that would make it more likely that she will use the block. However, even in that case, you may not get anything the first year or two. The best way to get the thing really going is to get some cocoons and put them out with your blocks. Thanks, Rich. Um, these, questions, oh, these questions might jump around a little bit. No problem. Okay. <laughs> I'm reading them. I also happen to in. know because I called Chenards yesterday that they have still have a few mason bee cocoons left. Uh, they're ones that they got from the Lynn County Master Gardener Association. Um, so if somebody wants to have some seed stuff. I know they have them. There are likely other locations that still have them too, as um, many of the other nurseries in the area. Yeah, and we have folks joining us, I think, from the whole region. And so if you're not in the, you know, Corvallis, Albany, Philomath area, right. definitely give your garden center <clears throat> a call. A lot of them are still open and they are doing either delivery or curbside pickup. And so call, give, them a, give them a call. It's not too late to put some out. Um, 
So, and if I've already answered these, Rich, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to read them uh, off and you can give a short answer. Anywhere you want to go. Okay. Um, it's a lot, of, a lot coming out. I'm trying to keep track of. Um, so Amy has a question and uh, they would like to know how long after putting cocoons out this week should they hatch? Also, this is a two-part question. Also, can I add cocoons to the immersion, immers uh, immersion tube while other cocoons are still in there? I add more cocoons all the time, um, usually about five to seven days apart um, and or even seven to ten days apart, depending on how early we're doing it. Um, I also often take out the ones that have already hatched just to have more room in there. So I, if there's a hole in the cocoon, the bee has hatched out of it. Um, the hatching time depends a little bit on the weather. Um, if it's very, very cold at night, the bees still think it's, they're kind of in the refrigerator. But um, they, they need at least around 50, 55 degrees during the daytime, several days in a row. And if it's very heavy rain, that can also cause some issues with them emerging. Rich, do you want to add to that? Well, yes. Just the little minor thing is if you put the cocoons out, and you've waited a week like she was talking about, I usually remove all the cocoons, everything that was in the tube before I put the next batch out. The biggest reason for that is if there's any kind of parasites that may be in those cocoons, I don't want them to stay out there until they hatch. So I take them out and then I put all new fresh cocoons in. Don't worry if there's still a few left in that first batch. What you can do is put that first batch in a paper bag or a jar or something like that and store it off to the side just to see what does come out. So if there are still some bees in there, you can release them. Thank you. Um, Natalie has a question. Uh, can she use uh, paper straws as liners? Maybe you could talk about the tubes and the liners. Okay. The liners that we use, which are these are the straws, and this is the liner right here. This liner is paper. Um, if you are one of those that insist on doing it yourself, you can make your own liners with paper, and that should be cooking parchment paper. Don't use any other kind of paper, like newsprint, copy paper or what have you, do not use that kind of paper. That's not good. Use parchment paper, but you will find it's a lot of work, especially if you're doing them on a large number like what we do. We buy these. And as a matter of fact, we just received an order of 12,000 of these. And so we are very good at providing them at a very low cost compared to other places. So the answer is yes, you can do it, but you'll be smarter to just buy the things. I'm going to add one thing to that. One of the things that we do uh, when you go to the store, you buy a liner like this, but we go ahead and physically split them like this and using a paper cutter like this. What happens when you do that is in the fall when you're getting ready to harvest cocoons, it's so much easier to open these up and to get the cocoons yes. out instead of having to go and tear this open like a biscuit thing. And it just takes about two or three times longer to do that than it does to get the cocoons out the other way. So just a little tip and a hint. If you got some from the store that were not pre-split, pre-splitting them really will help you when it's time to harvest. Very much so. <clears throat> so Nigel has a question, um, and this is a question about uh, winter storage and bringing cocoons out of winter storage. So they've had mason bee houses for many years, but had not cleaned or harvested them until this year. During the late winter, we had a warm spell and I brought my cocoons inside to the fridge. I left them there for a few weeks, then found a lot of mold in the container. Any tips for this process? Okay. 
Um, yes. When you put the entire house, tubes and everything in your refrigerator, that particular system has a tremendous amount of moisture in it. And if we know anything about Oregon, anywhere we have moisture, we're going to have mold. So it's very important that if you're going to use your refrigerator to store your bees, that they be in tubes, like just the liners, or better yet, they're removed from the tubes. You have a lot more control over the moisture content or the level of humidity. You do want to keep it high, but you want to be able to look and see if you have a mold problem. So if you do have a mold problem, there are different ways to get rid of that, but that's a whole new ex extra thing there. So hopefully that will answer your question unless you want to add something, Renee. I think what I would like to add is that if you can't come to a cocoon harvesting class in the fall, which we put on uh, in Lynn and Benton County, uh, we're open to doing it in uh, Eugene or Salem if somebody can provide us a space for about 12 to 15 people. Um, just you can contact Rich or me, well, probably can contact me. Um, but anyhow, um, the, if you can't do that, please join B Notes. Uh, B Notes, if you go to lynnmastergardeners.com, um, you will find a pollinator section and there is a link to right, adding. Four. Pardon? Say, I'm sorry. So anyhow, you can add, um, you can join, add that and we do put instructions on there on how to do uh, har uh, harvesting and cleaning of cocoons. Yeah, and I want to say one of our comments was from Susan that says she loves bee notes. Thank you, Renee and Rich. This is definitely um, a good place. It's a, a e-newsletter. You can sign up, easy to unsubscribe for that, and you'll get really timely tips. Um, really good if you're, if you're new or if you're in the area. Um, and then the Lynn County Master Gardeners also put on the Beevent Pollinator Conference too. So you'll find all that information on their um, lynnmastergardeners.com association website. So I'll just leave this slide up for, for a little bit. Um, the next question is uh, from Natalie and this goes back to the basics. So she uh, would like to know what, uh, what can a beginner do to start a mason bee house? What are the things that are needed to have success? I think away, this Renee. might be a good time to put up the slide about what's a good house versus a bad house. Uh, Cause I think that's one of the things that uh, people do. They go out and buy a house and they don't really know what they're buying or why they're buying it exactly. So a very good house is a house that, and it doesn't have to be a wooden house. It could be a can, it could be um, some of the, uh, a tube or things like that, but it does need to have a dark hole at the back. Uh, dark darkness at the back. Um, what you want is a bit of an overhang. So when we're putting our block in or our tubes in, we are going back in far enough that this will be kept from be getting too much moisture. Um, we also want to be sure that it's a dark cover on the back of that. Um, so the overhang is really important. Sitting it, having it sit back a little bit helps a lot. Um, as far as bad houses are concerned, um, you want to be sure that you pay attention to uh, some of the things that are on the internet right now. Um, it has for a long time been uh, drilling holes into a block and you can make that a house. It works for a short period of time, but pests build up very, very quickly in that. Also, um, the uh, house that isn't deep enough, it's only four inches deep, or the holes are only four inches deep, will give you almost all male cocoons rather than female. Um, many of the ones that we see have bamboo in them, and bamboo cannot be opened. So if you can't open the tube, um, you can't harvest the cocoons, and that causes a pest buildup as well. Um, one of the cute ones that, that's kind of a teardrop thing um, is designed to hang. And with some wind and things like that, the eggs potentially could be displaced as well. So that's another issue. And then straws, um, especially plastic straws or plastic, even plastic uh, 
blocks are not recommended because they do hold moisture, they don't breathe as well. Um, so be, be careful with that. Teasel is an option though, that besides these two, um, besides the block and the tube, uh, you, teasel is readily available outside. You do want to look for ones that are stems that are about, uh, sections that are about six inches long. The back is, has automatic sectioning to it. So you can put teasel out and that's a great one. And these do open very easily. Bamboo will not open easily. Rich, do you have anything to add? Well, I think you covered it well. Thank you. All right, going down the list. So we're jumping all over the place. I hope that's all right with folks. Um, John has a question. Does the late spring make the parasitic wasp arrival later so mason bees can be safely left out past June? He says he doubts uh -huh. it if it's true, but maybe how much later? That has not been my experience. Um, pretty much every year I've ever gone out there to look for these parasitic wasps, usually around the last week in May, I will start seeing signs of them pretty much regardless of what the early late spring period has been. I'm not saying there won't ultimately be a shift, but I still think you would be very wise and smart to stick with the beginning of June as your takedown date. Because regardless of when you take it down, you probably are going to leave some mason bees out there who may be harassing you because your home is gone. But be assured or rest assured that usually by that time, even though there are still some females out there, they have no more eggs. They're just flying around because they're programmed to keep doing this until they die. So to protect all the rest of your bees, it is really important to get those cocoons out of the zone area where these parasitic wasps are. So June 1 is a date we've chosen. It's easy to remember. Thanks, Rich. And the um, thing to do with that, too, is once you take those blocks and tubes in, you're going to put them in a paper bag, and you're going to put them in your garage. Staple that paper bag shut so that any parasitic wasps that might happen to have gotten into your garage or shed um, won't be able to get into that bag. And they stay there until fall when we harvest the cocoons. Great. Thank you. Um, John had an, another question on this, and it he's asking, is there a list of early blooming plants that are good for the bees? It's hard to judge when to release bees without knowing whether what's in bloom is beneficial. Okay, that is a very challenging one. The plants that I use as my guide starts with big leaf maple trees and then willow trees. Most of the pollen that the mason bees acquire early in the season comes from trees, not flowers. The rare exception, or I should say the exception, would be organ grapes. So if you see big leaf maples that are budded out, and you've seen willow trees that are budded out, and you see organ grape, which is flowering, you're okay to release. Um, I also want to say that I have found on the Oregon State website a pretty good list called 25 Plants for Attractive Native Bees to Your Garden, um, and it has a nice list of some beginning things that you might want to do. Uh, they have, has a list of uh, plants for early spring and then mid spring and through the summer and also through the thing. So it's not just mason bees, but it will attract bees throughout the season. That's just one list. There's lots of lists out there. Thanks, Renee. And for everyone listening, um, I'll compile. We've, we've referred to a couple of websites and publications. I'll send out an email afterwards. So um, we'll, we'll get those resources to you. Um, and I will add, you know, I think we need more basin bees so they can take care of all this tree pollen because, uh, yeah, my sinuses would love it. More mason bees, oh, less yes. tree pollen. <laughs> That's a good analogy. If you get the allergies, it's time to release your bees. 
<laughs> release all the bees right now. <laughs> um, Nigel has a question and it's um, about some of the decorative type houses and how do they determine if there are viable cocoons in there? So maybe this is a type of house where it doesn't have removable tubes. Uh, can they just drill out the spaces and start over? Is there a way to save some of these less, um, less desirable types of houses? For those situations where people have wooden blocks, bamboo tubes, or any other nesting sites that cannot be cleaned out, the best advice I can give you is at the following spring, put this device, this block, these bamboo tubes in a cardboard box that's sealed, taped, with the exception of one hole on the side, the same size as a hole in the blocks or that the tube goes into. They will then come out of that block they'll find that one hole in the cardboard box and leave the cardboard box. Very few, if any of the bees, will come back in that box. So several weeks into the spring, like maybe middle of April or towards the end of April, you can take that box with the block inside of it, seal it shut, and get rid of it. Don't use it again. Great. Um, Kathleen, I'm not sure where you're joining us from, but she says uh, she knows her nights have been pretty cold, but they're still seeing lots of unhatched cocoons. Is that, I know you might have referred to this earlier, is that normal for now? Like what's our time frame for hatching of cocoons? Well, for one thing, I'm not sure what normal means anymore in our world. That being stated, the time frame that these cocoons will hatch can be quite a few weeks. It can be, in some cases, as early as in the February and well into April, like the middle of April, even later. But usually by the end of April, they're all gone. They're all hatched. Um, Let's see, I forgot the other part of the question. I think one of the things we also need to understand is that these bees list, live about six to eight weeks. So um, we're going to see them out in, in groups and stages anyhow. Um, and <clears throat> they're pretty much done by the beginning of June. So that's part of it, part of the equation too. Okay. Um, what I was and trying I'm to remember, kind of like Rich, I've forgotten the other part of the question. <laughs> yes, I, I remember the other part I was thinking. Sometimes when you open the emergence tube, you will see cocoons that have not hatched. Now, it could be that the bee died in there. It could be that the bee is parasitized. You know, there's a variety of reasons why those bees have not emerged. Usually it's not a good reason. So for that reason, if the cocoons that you have put out have not hatched within several weeks, I would say dispose of them because you may be taking a risk that you're not capable of recognizing the pest that might be in that tube. So it's just one of those what we call best management practices. We're not going to be able to save every bee what we want to do is save the healthy bees. And so this is one way to do that. Great. I have uh, a, a three questions from different folks, uh, all about the emergent tube. So maybe we can go back to that um, example that you have. And I think, Renee, it's a little hard to see your video, but um, Susan had a question about the tan substance around the um, exit hole. And Nigel is also curious what the diameter of that hole should be. So can the bee Okay, the, the, okay. the brown substance is actually poop. 
um, the bee has come out and the very, fir very first thing they do is get rid of all the stuff that's inside of their bodies that they've had for a very long period of time. The diameter of the whole weed drill is 5 16 It could be up to a half an inch. Um, you know, if you don't have a 5 6 five sixteen five sixteen inch drill, you can do a half an inch. Um, they just need a space that's big enough to come out. A quarter of an inch isn't quite big enough. They can get stuck. Um, if you can't use this type of an emergence tube, you could use something as simple as a can like this and just drill a hole in the, the end of it, again, with that half inch or, or, or five sixteenths inch hole for them to emerge. Uh, don't fill the tube more than half full, too, also with cocoons. That's another thing. They need some move, move, uh, room to move around. Hopefully that answered that question. I would like to add one thing on that. When Renee was talking about the hole being 516, if at all possible, try to keep it to that size. If you cannot, um, yes, you can go with a bigger hole, but you have to understand the larger the hole, especially when you get to a half inch, you may be providing access by wasp to get in there and get those cocoons. So that's one of the other reasons why you want to try to keep the hole, if you can, to 516. We did find that we had a quarter inch at one point by accident, and um, that also kind of could trap some of the larger female bees from coming out. So um, the males would come out fine, but not the females. Ooh, yeah. gotcha. Um, Diane had a question, if you are reusing that tube, do you need to clean it every time, like if you're um, putting out different batches of cocoons over the season, do you need to clean it in between or can you just put it out once and just refill it? Cleaning is always a good idea. And I think that's one thing we've definitely learned over the past couple of weeks because if there's any kind of pathogens or parasites or anything in there, it's always one of those extra things that will remove that possibility. But if you cannot clean it, don't worry about it. Just put the cocoons in there because it's more important to get the bees out. And cleaning would be a light bleach solution. Water with a, just a little tiny bit of bleach in it would be very sufficient. Great. Yeah. Um, Kevin and Lori are brand new to Mason Bees, and they have some questions about the life cycle. So when can they expect to see new cocoons um, and kind of what to do with them? And I think maybe you have a slide. Do we you want to go over slide. the life cycle? Yeah, we have a okay. great slide, I think, that would show that. Okay, let me pull that up here. I think it is. different numbers on them now. I thought it was near Yeah, we, ha we were organized, and then I think I messed that up for you. How does this one look? Perfect. Okay, and then again, if folks, if the video is over the slide, you can always pick up and drag our uh, faces around there. So if one of you could just kind of go through and talk about the timing of this life cycle, that would be great. Uh, basically, you, we know that they mate in April and March, um, March and April time. Um, what happens is there's a mud wall, and um, then the female mason bee uh, puts in a pollen ball uh, and lays her egg. Um, and about 10 days after that egg is laid, it becomes a pupa. And then the larva spends a cocoon around the bee uh, and the bee develops inside from June to October. In no October, November, we harvest the cocoons. And then we, um, we actually, after we harvest them, we put them in our refrigerator bin uh, for this, the winter uh, in a cool controlled location. And then the following month, March, we put them back out, the cocoons back out again. That's a very simple, quick life cycle thing. Um, Rich, you wanna add anything to that? I think that's a very basic, good description of it, yes. Um, Amy has a question. Uh, she'd like to know a little bit more about the mud and the mud source. Does, uh, do they need to keep it muddy or is a wet dirt acceptable? And I think this is kind of a specific well, answer, right? They have a preference. Yes, they do. 
mason bees do have a very specific preference for the type of mud. As a matter of fact, we had to invent some new words to describe it. And the best description for the mud that mason bees prefer is clay. That is mud with a lot of clay. They don't want grit. So one good dis way of dis determining if the mud that you have in your yard is acceptable is to take a piece of that mud, a pinch of it between your thumb and your trigger finger and just move it around. If it feels very slick and greasy, that's good. If it's very gritty, they probably will not use it. That being said, the best way to create a mud pit for them, if you feel you need to do this, is to dig a hole and pile dirt next to that hole and right near the top of that pile is to put a little drip emitter, a bucket or something that drips very, very slowly. So what happens is where the drip is hitting, it's very soupy and wet. And as you move from that, it gets drier and drier. That gives the bee the option of picking the mud style that she wants, very soupy, very dry. And then she will use that to provision her nest. I think this is a good point to also point out that you don't want to mulch everything because you do want to have some mud exposed. And you also don't want to use weed cloth because there are other bees besides mason bees that use the ground for nesting. In fact, about 70% of the 70, 77% of the bees are ground nesters, which was kind of a surprise to me when I first started learning about bees. And it probably is a surprise to many of you, you too. And also that a lot of our recommendations are, that we're talking about here are for the Willamette Valley. We want to be sure that we make that clear. Thanks. Um, Susan had a question. You had mentioned that teasel could be used as a tube. And um, where, where do you find that? Where can you get that? Not something you buy in the <laughs> store, right? <laughs> I'm not sure of any place in Oregon where, Oregon where it does not exist a, below a thousand meters. Um, you, will, you can harvest it pretty much anywhere. The best time to harvest it is probably in the late fall when it's starting to turn gray or better yet in the early spring when it's dry and gray. Um, you don't want it green. I assure you, on the other hand, if you go out there to some of these places, which are usually along the roadways, and harvest teasel, you will get a lot of funny looks from people who are driving by wondering, why is that person harvesting weeds? But the thing is, it's an excellent tube for the bees. And the biggest reason for that is, we keep talking about the 5 16th inch hole which is standardized for mason bees. However, we do know if you mix a bunch of teasels together, you get different size holes. And there are some mason bees that are small, and they do prefer a small hole, like a quarter of an inch, maybe even smaller. And there's a few that prefer bigger holes. So the 5 16th hole that we put in our blocks is just the standard number. It's the most common number, sort of like the bell curve. The majority of the bees prefer this size hole. But if you can provide teasel or other plants that are hollow stem, they will very much appreciate that opportunity and the option of different sizes. And for some of you who don't are kind of new to the area or may not know what teasel looks like, it is a fairly tall plant that has a thistly looking top to it, a cone shaped top to it. And you'll, if you pineapple. look along the side of the road, you're going to see stands of that everywhere. Uh, here's an example of the different sizes of holes that you can get, um, as closer. Rich said, and closer. Yeah. And um, so uh, one of the things you want to be careful about though, is when you harvest it, try to make sure that you get things that are, um, six inches long for mason bees this a smaller hole shorter will attract some other bees but the mason bee would want the one that's about a five sixteenths inch hole um 
they will use a slightly larger, a slightly smaller hull. And um, these are kind of sticky, stickery on the outside. And Rich has said that he takes a glove and just goes down it and smooths off and tears off those little tiny pieces. <clears throat> One thing I would like to mention, this is as good a time as any, because many of you may not be that familiar with mason bees, is why six inches? How and where did that number come from? Basically, it's another one of those things where we learn from optimal growing conditions for bees. Because you see, the female bee, when she lays her eggs, she can choose the sex of that offspring. She can decide whether it's male or female. And in nature, generally speaking, the female is the more valuable of the two because she can do the reproduction, she has the eggs. So it's nature's way of protecting the females. So when you have a six inch tube, generally what happens is in the bottom half of the three inch tube, she will lay eggs that will become females. And the outer half of the tube, those three inches approximately there, she will usually put predominantly males. That is, if the tube gets attacked by woodpeckers, mice, or other things, the guys go first, and we protect the female. So the six inch tube is a standard. Some people will use eight inch, 10 inch, or even longer. Beyond about eight to 10 inches, the bees usually block off that hole, and they won't use a deeper part. So the reason why we use six is we're trying to get that even distribution of females and males. Um, Brooke, if you would do slide, I believe it's 10, there is a picture of what's inside of, of the Blue Orchard Bee hole. By the way, it, uh, we have on that slide Bob. Uh, Bob stands for Blue Orchard Bee. I really think it should be Bobby, but because it's, it's the female doing all the work. But anyhow, uh, what you're going to see on that slide is that you are going to see the mud walls. Um, then you're going to see the cocoons. There's frass, uh, again, another word for uh, excrement, uh, poop. Um, and the bee does... Uh, do that in the process in the process of going through its life cycle um put out some frass it, the frass looks like little tiny black pepper things if you see yellow uh more fine fine uh things in your tube that would be evidence of mites and mites are very very common that almost everybody will have some mites um, and each each uh, hole will have about five to eight cocoons in the hole or in the tube. And then the mason bee has approximately 24 eggs that she'll lay during her lifetime. So I think that just kind of gives an, it shows you what it looks like inside the tube. Um, there's a couple of questions about dealing with pests. So let's shift and talk about what, some things that might go wrong. Um, so Hillary is concerned about birds bothering her, her nest box. If uh, they place a wire screen over the nest box with big enough holes for the bobs, but small enough to deter birds, will the bees still use that nest box or do you think that they will avoid it? We use chicken wire to protect the nest box from woodpeckers, birds, squirrels, mice. It works very well. I would suggest that you use chicken wire that has at least three quarter to one inch holes and that it be six inches from the front of the nest box. That way the bees can get through very easy and still have an open flight in front of the box. But yes, it's a very effective protective means. Um. Keeping on that theme, Diane has a question. Um, we've already, you've already talked about parasitic wasps and mites. Do ants bother mason bees? Yes, they do. Um, depending on the ant, they may be after the larva and pupas or the pollen. Um, ant control is very challenging. First, you don't want to use any pesticides. And by pesticides, I mean any kind of chemicals that you're going to put there 
with the intent of killing the ants, whether it's a raid, boric acid, dynam uh, any of those products, because chances are when you apply them in the vicinity of a nesting site, you're going to increase the odds that you're going to harm those bees. Um, that's a really good lead in to the question from John. So John has um, apple and pear trees and is dealing with some disease issues on the trees. Um, are there any thoughts that you have? You've talked about insecticides, but any thoughts about fungicides? Um, and this might be a question we can answer offline too. Um, other pesticides that might affect mason bee survival? Thinking okay, about pining well, we maybe too? Yeah. When we use the term pesticide, we're talking about a very broad spectrum of chemicals that are used. Fungicides, miticides, herbicides, and so forth. And you might think, oh, well, I'm using a fungicide. That's not an insecticide. That's true, but we do know that some of these other classes of chemicals that are herbicides, fungicides, and so forth, do have an effect on the bees. It may be affecting the behavior of the adult bee. It may be affecting the development of the juvenile bee. But all of them have the potential of having some effect on the bees. And for that reason, it's personally, in my opinion, a risky thing to mix the two. So if you are going to have, say, an apple orchard, and you have mason bees out there, and you're going to spray with some fungicides to cover those boxes at night, at the end of the day. So you are literally trapping the bees in there, spray in that evening, and then take those covers off before light the following morning. That's one thing. Otherwise, you have to face the decision of whether the way I want to grow my apples is incompatible with protecting the mason bees. So the other way you can do that would be to remove the mason bees from the apple area itself and put them off to the side somewhere so they will not be in contact with what you apply. One thing that's very extremely important is never to spray when anything is flowering. Uh, because they, bees are out there collecting pollen. So keep that in mind as well. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and then I had a question I received by email earlier. And this is um, someone, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, who is pondering also getting a honeybee hive set up. And they want to mm -hmm. know if having this honeybee hive is going to put stress on the solitary bees that are in their um, yard and all the effort that they put into building up the population of these solitary bees. Can you speak to any competition that you've noticed? That is still quite a controversial issue between honeybee producers, whether they're commercial or hobbyists, and people like myself who are native bee fanatics. The simple answer is this. I will tell you the way I look at the problem. When you have a honeybee hive, a healthy honeybee hive that maybe has a couple of supers on it, you potentially could have 30, 40,000 bees in that box. They have to eat. So there's 30, 40,000 mouths that need to be fed. Those honeybees may go several miles if that is necessary for them to get the food they need. A mason bee cannot do that. A mason bee is stuck in a relatively small location relative to honeybees. A mason bee's foraging distance is probably about the length of a football field. That is the whole length. So to me, there is indeed competition. We do not know to what extent that competition is actually occurring out there because it's an incredibly difficult thing to measure. 
but just simply looking at it from the standpoint of number of mouth per unit area, it's going to have some impact. There's no question about that. My personal feeling is if you are trying to create a bee heaven for native bees, you don't want honeybees there as well. Move them somewhere off, move them a mile somewhere aware. I think this is a good time to plug one of our photographs that we have about a comparison of uh, how a honeybee uh, versus a mason bee um, does their uh, pollinating. Um, the, the blue orchard mason bee is particularly, uh, if you can go to the slide just above that one, or uh, slide number two first. Um, number, uh, the blue orchard bee can, um, seven blue orchard mason bees can pollinate an apple or a cherry tree. You need over 500 honeybees to do that. And the reason for that is that, uh, slide number five, um, is that, um, it takes about five contacts for a honeybee to fully pollinate a flower. Uh, most of the pollen goes into a little special pocket uh, on the honeybee, so they don't have as much pollen on their body. Versus the blue orchard bee has, it's really, really messy, like a kindergartner. Um, it gets pollen all over its body so that when it she contacts the flower, mm -hmm. she pollinates it with just one touch. So um, the other thing is, as Rich had pointed out, um, the honeybees cost a lot to uh, keep. Um, they take a lot of time. The blue orchard bee probably will take you four to 10 hours a, a, week, a year to take care of. Um, the blue orchard bee does not make honey. So for those who are new to this, be aware of that. Um, and the blue orchard bee is native. Um, the honeybee is European. Uh, it was brought over by the settlers. So um, the uh, other thing is that the blue orchard mason bee goes out and forages very, very early in the morning and stays out very, very late. Um, and it also will go out in light rain. The honeybee is more like the flex worker that we have right now during the coronavirus who's staying at home and working from home. They've looked out and said, nope, the conditions aren't right. Um, it's, you know, it's raining out there. Um, it's not quite up to 60 degrees. Um, you know, and I, and I really like to go out when it's 60 degrees. Um, the mason bee will be out there in the, the 50 degree temperatures. And um, if there's a light rain, they'll also be out there working, just like a farmer working from morning to night. So those are just some of the differences. And then of course, the travel distance. Um, so we are nearing the end of our time. There are a couple questions still in our queue. Um, and so I'm gonna ha probably have you guys answer those off offline and we'll we'll get back to you folks if we weren't able to answer your question um but just to wrap it up maybe i don't know rich if you want to give us a little summary i know you have a an awesome shirt maybe you want to share with people i don't know if you're game for sharing okay. with 40 yeah. people <laughs> what it's basically saying is we've always needed the bees now the bees need us and so my work with the Master Gardener Group and with the Extension Service, as well as the Oregon Bee Atlas is obviously someone who's a fanatic about bees. Because we need to understand they play a very special role in our ecosystem. There is no one bee that's good for everything. Like all the different types of crops that we have, we need different pollinators to work with those crops. If you have tomatoes, honeybees are no good. You need bumblebees, you need other kinds of bees. If you have caneberries, there's some mason bees that are good for that. So we need to protect all the bees, and that does include the honeybees. But we do need to remember that when we have large concentration of honeybees, they do have a potential impact on that particular environment, not just other bees, but other pollinators that also need that pollen and nectar from these flowers. So the best thing to do in our yard is 
not necessarily to practice the way I do, which is basically hands off. Whatever nature wants, nature gets. Not many people can do that in your yards. I totally agree with that. But you can do many things in your yard. You should be very careful about any kind of pesticides you're using. Is there a better alternative? So think about those things. And if you're looking for more information along these lines, be sure you check with the Extension Service. There are many, many individual specialists within these programs that can help. So I know insects. If it has roots, don't talk to me, that kind of thing. So keep that in mind. Besides the things that we're doing here, what we're trying to do is to help our community become better stewards of the environment that we have and to grow healthier foods for our family. That's really what all this is about. So you got questions, keep them coming. And you wanna know more, check with the other extension people as well. Thank you. I also would like to add, and this would be on slide four if you wanna put that back up again. We are here to help answer questions. Um, LynnCountyMasterGardeners.com has the, a lot of pollinator information, including some of the past bee notes that Rich and I have put out uh, and so forth. Um, we continue to do that. We have about 735 bee note subscribers now, which is just amazing to me. Um, I hope that some of you who are not bee note subscribers will go ahead and do that because what we're doing is sending out timely information um, giving you some help as to how to handle mason bees, but also other pollinators. There's a terrific past bee notes on how to help plant, uh, effectively plant, um, shoot, name's gone for me, um, monarch, for blue, uh, monarch, the uh, milkweed, how to effectively plant milkweed around the edges rather than planting it scattered and there's some studies have been done on that so and then register in the fall if you're in the um in the central area here for the cocoon harvesting classes even if you don't have cocoons yet or don't have mason bees you can come and learn more about them we will have some cocoons for you to harvest so that you can learn more and our goal is to answer questions right, thank you Brooks. For yeah. putting all this together for us. Yeah, thanks for giving this a shot. I know we're in a in some different times, but I really appreciate both of you spending some time with our community members to answer their questions. Um, I will follow up with all of our participants with these links and resources and some of this information from the slides that Renee and Rich shared. So wait for that email will be showing up here um, probably later today or tomorrow. So with that, um, thank you all very much. And we really appreciate you spending an hour with us. Have a wonderful day. All right. Bye-bye.